in the news a lot uh, and definitely on people's minds with less than three months now to go before the, uh, the election. So just to start with a, a couple introductory kind of points that I probably don't need to make to an audience like this that is you know, coming to an event that's you know, about voting and elections. So I think everyone probably knows why it's important to, to vote. But it is interesting, I think, to be reminded about how close elections are sometimes, even at the presidential level. You know, where in the 2000 presidential election that you know, George Bush narrowly won uh, over Al Gore, in, in that election had just one vote per precinct changed in Florida that would have changed the outcome of that election. In 2016 with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, just 77,000, a little under 78,000 more votes uh, for Clinton in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin would have made Clinton president. She would have won a majority of the electoral votes. And so again, that's a, an incredibly close election. When you think of the you know, more than 100 million votes cast in that election, 77,000 votes, basically the difference in that presidential election. And so just the, the closeness of elections shows that the importance of voting really you know, does matter. But then two other reasons too that are more substantive in terms of policy outcomes. There's a lot of research in political science that shows that politicians actually do pay more attention to people who vote than people who don't vote. Uh, that's one reason that you know, things like Social Security uh, is, has such broad support, bipartisan support among Democrats and Republicans um, because people who are older vote more than people who are younger. And this is one thing I tell my students all the time that, you know, if you want to have more political clout, you need to start voting. And young people don't vote as much as older people. And so there's, again, a lot of evidence to, to back that up. And then finally, voting obviously is the mechanism for making democracy work. It's the way that we hold our politicians accountable. And we, if we don't vote, we really don't have a claim to say that we are, you know, uh, trying to influence uh, the the behavior of our politicians. Um, and finally, the, the last point here then is this uh, notion that if you actually look at a, uh, a map of the Electoral College, most states had their electoral votes that would have been cast for did not vote rather than either Clinton or Trump in the most recent election. And this is kind of a shocking map if you haven't ever seen this before. But here's what the Electoral College map looks like if you just tally up the votes for Trump and Clinton uh, and then also tally up the number of people who did not vote. And did not vote carried 471 electoral votes. Uh, Clinton won 51 and Trump carried 16, with Wisconsin and Iowa, the only two states in the country, that Trump actually had more votes than people who didn't vote. And so that, again, is a pretty stunning visual representation, I think, of, of the importance of voting. Uh, and and 2020 is going to be, I think, another good example of that. Um, so just a, a little bit of additional background here is just to situate the whole topic of voting within the law. And this is another thing that, you know, can be shocking to people the first time they, they hear it, because it seems like it, it can't be right. Uh, but there actually is no affirmative right to vote in the U.S. Constitution. Um, there are parts of the Constitution amendments that talk about voting. So the 15th, the 19th, this has been getting a lot of attention with the 100th anniversary of the uh, amendment that gave women the right to vote in the 26th. So those are the amendments that had to do with preventing discrimination based on race with the 15th Amendment after the Civil War, uh, gender with the 19th Amendment, and then age for 18 to 20 year olds who are given the right to vote uh, in the, uh, the 26th Amendment. And so those all are, are parts of the Constitution that talk about uh, preventing discrimination based on those characteristics. But there, for example, there is no right even to vote for the president at all unless our state legislature gives us the right to do that. That's what the Electoral College is, that the state legislature determines the manner in which the electoral votes are cast. Now, since the very early years of our nation's history, most state legislatures did decide they would allocate votes uh, based on the popular vote, and it's been true for more than 200 years now. But early on, there are some states that it wasn't determined by the popular vote. And that's, again, that's not even in the Constitution. So Representative Mark Pocan from our congressional district has been uh, trying to start a movement to amend the Constitution to change this. He wants to put in an affirmative right to vote in the Constitution. Uh, and that seems like that's something that's long overdue. 
Now, while the Constitution itself doesn't have a whole lot to say about voting in this in that way, um, the 1965 Voting Rights Act was really important, a piece of landmark legislation that's been getting a little more attention on um, the last uh, few weeks uh, with the passing of John Lewis, who played a, a critical role in, in helping put pressure on Congress to, to pass that law. Um, and what the Voting Rights Act does is that it, it really, for the first time, gave the African Americans in the South the actual right to vote that they had been granted with the 15th Amendment, but really been denied because of all the tactics of voter suppression. And so it banned literacy tests and other restrictions on the right to vote, also provided for federal marshals to be able to actually go enforce the law in the South. And then these different parts of the law, Section 2 uh, said that you can't be denied the right to vote based on race. Section 5, uh, which was one of the strongest parts of the law, that provided for pre-clearance of any changes in electoral practices. So things like moving a voting uh, precinct or the polling place or redistricting or changing the way that elections were conducted. So all of those things in the covered jurisdictions in the South would have to be pre-cleared by the Justice Department in order to, before you could change those parts of the, the voting laws. But unfortunately in 2013, uh, section four of the Voting Rights Act was struck down in Shelby versus Holder, and which made section five basically inoperable. So since 2013, that important part of the Voting Rights Act, the pre-clearance part, has not been operable basically. And so this has allowed things like voter ID laws and discriminatory redistricting practices to go into effect in these previously covered jurisdictions. Now, you can still sue as a plaintiff to try to overturn those discriminatory practices but not until they're in place and a damage has been done. The great thing about Section 5 was it stopped those things from happening before they went into effect. And so that's something that we'll talk about at the end in terms of how to reform voting laws. And, and one thing that uh, the House passed earlier this year was uh, a new part of the Voting Rights Act that would basically overturn Shelby versus Holder. Um, then finally, in the Voting Rights Act, it also was amended in 1975 to include protection for language minorities. So any part of the country in which 5% of the population uh, isn't native English speakers or 10,000 citizens with limited English proficiency uh, would be covered by the Voting Rights Act as well. Now, what's happened in the last, I would say, two or three election cycles, but going back even as much as, as 10 years, um, is what uh, law professor Richard Hazen, who's probably the top voting rights expert in the country, uh, has called the voting wars. And this is a recent book he has uh, with that title, where he points out that the, the process of voting and the laws governing voting didn't used to be such a partisan issue. And it's really just in the last decade that's become so, uh, so partisan and so polarized. And so one thing that's been happening in the last couple election cycles um, are different laws at the state level designed to diminish voter access. And so there were 99 different bills introduced uh, last year in 31 different state legislatures aimed at trying to limit the access to voting, according to the Brennan Center study. Um, and a lot of this was made possible because of the Shelby decision in the, again, those covered states that now long, no longer have to, uh, to follow that part of the law. So what kinds of things are, are being done here and how is this going to potentially affect voting um, this, this fall? Well, there are a lot of, of different uh, efforts underway to try to suppress the vote. Voter ID laws uh, have been pretty common uh, across the country in the, uh, in the last uh, six to eight years. Wisconsin has one of the more restrictive voter ID laws uh, among the states. Uh, limits on early voting, that there had been a push in recent years to try to increase early voting to let people vote before election day. Now those are being scaled back in some states. Um, purges of voter registration lists. You may have followed the dispute here in Wisconsin where there was an effort to, uh, to purge our voter registration lists, and that's been delayed now until after the election by the Wisconsin Election Commission. And in some states, they, they have a, a, a process called exact matching, you know, where they match the voter registration list to say a driver's license list. And if the names don't match exactly, they take you off the voter registration list, like a, if there's a middle initial missing or something like that. Uh, and so that leads to a lot of people 
being removed from voter registration files that, that shouldn't be. Now, one point on this, and we can come back to this in Q&A if people have more questions about what happened here in Wisconsin, but, but it, it is necessary to update voter lists because people move, people die. And so every two years, states do a, a comprehensive uh, update to make sure their voter registration lists are current. But what voting uh, advocates really try to resist is any kind of major purge shortly before an election because you always are going to remove some people that shouldn't have been removed. That always happens. Um, another uh, uh, tactic along these lines is called voter caging where uh, they'll send out a, a, a a postcard to an address, and if it doesn't get sent back saying, you know, are you a registered voter, you'll be removed from the voter rolls. Um, then partisan redistricting, um, which could become a, a backdoor tool for limiting voting, uh, minority voting rights uh, because of the recent decision by the Supreme Court, uh, US Supreme Court to get out of the partisan redistricting business. Um, that limits the ability of, of people to have the same voting power in a state depending on which party they, they belong to. Then felon, disenfran felon disenfranchisement uh, has disenfranchised millions of people uh, across the country where even once you're out of prison in some states, you can't ever vote again unless you uh, appeal for uh, clemency to be put back on the voter rolls, which you know, most people don't do. And so that's been something that has also disenfranchised many people. Closing polling places in urban areas, you know, we saw that happen in Milwaukee in the, the April. Uh, a, a primary uh, April election with the state Supreme Court, um, where just because of the pandemic, they didn't have enough poll workers, they had to shut down most of the polling places in Milwaukee, which leads to longer wait times and many people just give up and don't vote then. Uh, so that's another uh, tactic for voter suppression. And then uh, one thing that happened in Texas, some other states have done this, is the overly broad purges of non-citizens from voter rolls. And so they will because uh, citizens can't vote, and so you do want to try to make sure that your voter rolls don't have non-citizens. But they were um, they had faulty lists, basically, where there'd be you know common surnames that would appear to be the same as someone who was not a citizen. But they ended up removing you know tens of thousands of people who actually were citizens, and so that's been another problem. And then finally, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about the, the mail-in voting. And this is the unequal scrutiny given to different mail ballots. Um, there was you know, one example, a colleague of mine uh, was involved in some litigation uh, on precisely this question in Georgia, where there were election officials who would, on the, on the mail-in ballots, you had to give your, uh, the year of your birth not the date, uh, the full date, but the year of your birth. And if you put your full month, day, and year, they would throw it out, which is ridiculous because if you put the month, day, and year, of course you have the year. Uh, and so if there, and, and some uh, you know, election officials wouldn't do that and they would count it. And so that kind of unequal scrutiny just is you know, not a, a fair uh, process as well. And, and th that too is often unequally applied uh, based on the partisan uh, sort of uh, concentration in a given voting area. And then most recently, is getting a lot of attention in the news the last week, is trying to limit voting by undermining the post office. So removing mailboxes, uh, removing the sorting machines, as, uh, the, and the president made it clear that the purpose for doing this was trying to, uh, to, to limit voting. And so there's been pressure now to, to change that. Um, so just to give one example from the 2018 midterm elections of the consequences of this kind of voter suppression, and this is you know, happening even without the pandemic. So this is just in a normal midterm election. Uh, you, the, in the governor's race between Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp, uh, Kemp at the time was Secretary of State of Georgia, and he was in charge of overseeing the voter rolls. And so between 2012 and 2016, about one and a half million people were removed from voter rolls. And uh, shortly before he announced uh, running for governor, he really sort of stepped up the voter purges and over half a million were removed from the rolls in July of 2017. And what a lot of election experts said was one of the biggest mass disenfranchisements in history. And they did use this exact match process uh, that was actually struck down by a federal judge shortly before the election because 70% of the people on that list were African-Americans, so much higher percentage than the state overall. And that was a close enough election 
that Abrams probably would have been elected the first female African-American governor of the United States had it not been for those voter purges. So just again, one example of the consequences of that. Okay, so the next topic then, something that I wanted to focus on quite a bit you know, for, for this election in the, this context of voting during the pandemic is the uh, using mailed-in ballots, because that is going to be the main mechanism for people to be able to vote safely in the pandemic. And especially if there is a, a second wave this fall that some people are still uh, worried about that, um, that voting by mail is definitely going to be the safest way to vote in terms of not you know, risking uh, getting the virus when you go to the polling places. So I just wanted to give you the, the context of mailed ballots. And you can see that there's been this general increase uh, in mailed in ballots uh, going back, the data here goes from 1992 up to the 2018 midterm. The green line is the line uh, for the, the mailed in uh, ballots. That was gone from about 8% in 1992 up to 24% in 2018. Uh, the in-person early voting also has increased substantially from almost non-existent. You know, back in 1992, hardly anybody did that, up to uh, between 15 and 12% of all voters casting their ballots in, in that way, uh, uh, voting early in person. So you go to the clerk's office and you, you vote there. So you can see that it had been back in the 1990s, 90, over 90% 90 of all people voting on election day at their polling place that's down now to about 60%. So a big change in the way that people are voting. And most people are thinking that's gonna drop another 15, 20 points this fall. That we could go up, we could possibly have more people voting by mail in this election than are voting in person. It may not quite hit that level, but it's possible we'll, we'll hit that level of voting by mail uh, that, because of the, the pandemic. So why has this been so controversial? Like, why is this you know, something that you know, has gotten so much attention and the, uh, so, uh, you know, the kind of claims that President Trump is making about how this is just an effort by Democrats to steal the election? So what's the controversy about? Well, first, I think it's important to understand the different types of voting by mail and the variation across the states and how uh, mailed-in ballots are, are used. So first you have the eight states that still use the uh, process that used to be the standard practice of limited absentee voting, meaning that in order to cast an absentee vote, you actually have to have a, a reason for doing it. You have to you know, show evidence that you're going to be out of the state on election day. You have to be you know, of, of poor health that you can't uh, make it to the polling place let say you're in a, in a nursing home, um, you know, something like that, that is a, an actual physical reason why you can't vote at your polling place. There's still eight states that, that have that um, limitation. Then you have 34 states, including Wisconsin, that use what's called no excuse absentee voting. And there you can just you know, request an absentee ballot, they mail it to you, you fill it out, you mail it back in, and that's the, the way that most states do the mail-in voting. Mail -in voting. And you have five states with Oregon and Washington being the pioneers here. So Oregon is, has been doing this for 20 years now, Washington shortly after that. There are now five states that use uh, mail for all their elections. Like they don't have polling places anymore at all and they, they just vote by mail. Uh, and there are five states that do that. And there are three more states that are doing that just for this election. Uh, for 2020 because of the pandemic. And so uh, if you try to parse what President Trump is, is concerned about, it seems like he's mostly worried about those last eight states plus DC uh, of the universal voting by mail. But then he's also criticizing efforts to do things like mail ballot request forms to all voters like we're doing here in Wisconsin. Our election commission uh, decided, what, about a month ago now, that they would mail request forms to everyone who hadn't ever voted by mail before. So if they wanted to get a mail-in ballot, they, they could. They could send that request in. And even that is something that the president has criticized. And his concern is that he claims that this will lead to, to fraud. And that because you'll have all of those ballots out there floating around, 
um, that this is going to, to lead to, to fraud and, and Democrats stealing the election. Um, well, there have been a lot of systematic studies of this, and one of them, the Conservative uh, Heritage Foundation, actually had one of the biggest databases on election fraud, and uh, MIT, which they have a great website on, on voting and, and early voting and voting by mail. If you're interested in this topic, I encourage you to, to go to that uh, website. But they did an analysis of the, of the data on election fraud and found that over the last 20 years, there are only 143 cases of mail ballot fraud. Uh, that ended in a criminal conviction. That's out of a total of 1,200 fraud cases of, of any kind. And so this is about seven to eight cases a year across the nation, uh, or, you know, that's what, uh, five zeros and six or whatever, that would be six one millionth or something of the, of the of a percent. Uh, and that's out of 250 million votes e examined. And so it's just a vanishingly small number of cases of actual fraud being perpetrated through mail-in ballots. In Oregon, again, that has the most substantial uh, experience with mail-in voting. Um, they've done that since the year 2000. There have only been two confirmed cases out of fraud in Oregon out of 50 million mail-in votes over that time. Uh, and so this just, it just doesn't happen. Uh, and the, so the, you, know, you have uh, you know, hundreds of millions of, of ballots being cast this way and the incidence of fraud is just uh, minuscule. And the, the concern that, the other second concern then that Trump has, has talked about is this question of ballot harvesting. And that is when you allow people to collect ballots um, that you didn't fill out yourself, but other people filled out and you can collect them and then deposit them at the clerk's office. Um, most states don't allow that. There are a few states that do. Uh, some states, you know, say that a single person can bring as many as three ballots, but they have to sign on there that they you know, had permission to bring the ballot in. Um, and so, and, and I think this is a valid point that there certainly is more potential for uh, misconduct if you are in a state that allows that kind of ballot harvesting. But even there, there are safeguards in place to make sure that there isn't fraud. Um, and the, the biggest one being the, the, the signature confirmation that you have to have your signature on the ballot and it has to be witnessed by someone else that also you know, puts their address on it. Uh, many states have barcodes now they put on the, the ballots. You can actually track the, uh, the vote for each individual uh, voter. And so it's just simply quite difficult to actually do that. And in the two cases in the last couple of years where there has been uh, efforts to to uh, engage in uh, ballot harvesting uh, and fraud, uh, we're both caught because if you do this, it becomes obvious that's what you're doing and there are safeguards in place to prevent it from happening. So there was a Republican candidate in North Carolina, a congressional race uh, in the last midterm that they tried to do this. And it was clear that this fraud was going on and they had a new election. Same thing in New Jersey, in Patterson, New Jersey, there's another uh, election there that they've been doing some of this ballot harvesting. Um, and so there too, a judge you know, said that they have to have a new election. Um, and so these examples of, of fraud using that type of, of ballot harvesting with mail-in votes, again, is very rare, but also it's going to be so obvious if it's conducted on a big enough level to steal an election that you'll be able to detect it and, and find it out. And so again, it's just not given the, the potential for uh, you know, danger to people from voting in person, um, if the potential downside of voting by mail is minuscule in comparison. Now, on the other hand, there are some other challenges to, uh, to voting by mail, and some that are in the media get blown way out of proportion. Um, and that, like this one is one you see cited all the time, that, uh, ballots that are requested aren't returned. About, it's higher than you might guess, about 23% of ballots uh, are not returned nationwide of requested mail-in ballots. And so this you know, raises the concern then, well, if all these ballots are floating around, then isn't that a uh, potential for, for fraud? But again, there's just no evidence that that actually happened. So these are people who requested a ballot and then decided, oh, I'm gonna go vote in person anyway. And so they just don't, and who knows, maybe they waited too long and procrastinated filling it out and realized, oops, I ran out of time, I better go vote in person. Uh, and so that is not a source of fraud, it's just 
the, the way that the processes always work. Now, this next point is a, a, a serious concern of advocates of voting who want to get more people to vote. Um, it, and specifically in the context of this 2020 uh, election in November. Um, and that is because of the huge surge in mail-in voting that we've seen, you know, big, big increases in most states because of the, the pandemic, um, the return ballots are being rejected at a higher rate than in-person voting. Um, and this will, again, even be more true in 2020. And it, traditionally, that is, is the case, that they're between you know, three-tenths of 1% and up to 1.5% of all mailed-in ballots are rejected, which is higher than the percentage of in-person ballots that are rejected. Um, and for the mailed-in ballots, it's most often because of forgetting to put the address of the witness, that's the big one, and signature match is the other one. The, the signature may not you know, match exactly, so they'll, they'll not count it. Um, and so when you have this surge of people voting by mail, like we have this year, more people will make mistakes because they're not used to the process. Uh, and so there needs to be more of a, a campaign for voter, voter education to tell people you know, what they need to do, uh, because otherwise there will be a lot of people who end up not having their ballots counted because of mistakes that they made uh, in the, the voting process. When you combine that then with these last two points, that are again specific to the 2020 election, you know, it shows that there are some real challenges to voting by mail. Even if it is safe and secure in terms of not being subjected to voter fraud, you know, there are downsides. And one, and we definitely saw this in the April election here in Wisconsin, is the clerk's offices were overwhelmed. Like they just had never seen anything like this uh, in an April election before, and they just couldn't get the ballots out on time. And so there were, you know, some quite a few people who either didn't ever receive their ballots or they got them so late that they couldn't vote. Um, and then finally, with the undermining of the post office, that is actually, you know, they're uh, making, uh, you know, this effort to intentionally slow down the mail, that could, uh, you know, mess up the works even more. Although, again, there are efforts being made right now to reverse those uh, changes that have been made. So this next slide just shows the April election here in Wisconsin, just to, to show the, the huge increase we had in absentee ballots. And this is more than a flip of what you normally see. And so we had 1.1 uh, million, one, almost a little over 1.15 million uh, ballots cast by, by mail uh, and under 400,000 cast by pers in person. So about three quarters were cast by mail. Usually it'd be the reverse, about three quarters to 80% would be in person and maybe 25% would be by mail. Uh, and so just, you know, you have basically an additional you know, 700,000 requests for absentee ballots coming in. And then the, the bottom of the, the chart then uh, the, shows the, uh, the percentage that were actually uh, counted and those that were not returned. Now, Wisconsin actually is a much lower percentage than the national average. Remember the national average I chose 23% not returned. We only had 9%, so 9.3% about not returned. Um, but then there were uh, about, uh, 2,600 that were received too late to be counted. That's even with the extension they, they gave through the Supreme Court intervention to allow those that have been postmarked by the election day rather than received by the election day. Because the, this, uh, the normal practice is that the, the ballot has to be received by election day. They gave an additional uh, five days or an additional six days for those ballots to show up, but there were still 2,600 that were rejected because they were even after that date. Um, and then there were another, about 1.6%, so that's a lot, 20,000 ballots that were returned and rejected. And again, the, the biggest reason was the missing witness signature, that, or the witness address. That was the, uh, the biggest reason that, that they were rejected. The 20,000, now it wasn't a very close election for the state Supreme Court anyway, uh, but some local races were close enough that maybe those rejected ballots you know, could have made the difference. Uh, and so that's uh, something that really um, is significant. So finally, the, the last thing I want to talk about is another thing not uh, really specific to this election, but I think could end up being critical in this election. That is the role of the Electoral College. So we saw in 2016, of course, Hillary Clinton winning about 3 million more votes uh, than, than Donald Trump, uh, yet Trump winning the comfortable edge in the Electoral College. And so uh, that was only the most recent incident of that 
uh, where you have the popular vote winner losing, 1824, 1876, 1888, and then uh, 2000 with Bush and Gore, the other examples historically. So five times in our nation's history, we've had the popular vote winner uh, lose. And so uh, actually the, 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 uh, the Tilden Hayes race was the one in which uh, it was the only time the, uh, the loser actually won a majority of the vote. The others were all plurality winners. Um, so that's the big problem with the Electoral College. But there are other things too that critics of the Electoral College have pointed out. Um, one is that it really ignores the non-competitive states. So if you live in California or New York or you know, Wyoming or one of the you know, really Republican states, um, you, know, you basically don't have a presidential campaign in your state. Most of the campaign happens in the six to eight, maybe 10 battleground states. So Wisconsin, we always uh, are right up there in terms of campaign activity because we have traditionally been a battleground state. And so uh, parts of the state like the Fox River Valley, you know, often has the, the most TV ads per capita of anywhere in the country. Um, but there are other parts of the country that are just ignored because everyone knows um, that the Democrats going to win California and, and uh, New York and the Republicans going to win the Dakotas and, and, uh, and Wyoming. I used to say Texas. Texas isn't so clear anymore. That's moving more into the, uh, the, the battleground category. Um, and then the third thing is the small state bias. This is something that is often overlooked, but the, the Electoral College, you know, you, the way you get the number of electoral votes for a, a state is your number of House seats plus two, your two senators. So it's the size of your congressional delegation. So the small states, like the Dakotas and Wyoming, uh, they get three electoral votes. That's one electoral vote for every about uh, 200 and some thousand people, whereas the big states get one electoral vote for every 750,000 people. Uh, and so there's a, a huge inequality there in terms of the smaller states having more of a say in the Electoral College. In fact, in the 2000 election, if you just remove that small state bias, so you take your electoral votes minus two, and so just based on the size of your House delegation, Al Gore would have won the electoral votes. Uh, so there was enough of a small state bias there that put George Bush over the top uh, in 2000. And then finally, in close elections, the potential for mischief. Uh, the, the 1960 election with John F. Kennedy, the alleged fraud of the, the Daily Machine in, in Chicago, uh, delivering Illinois to him, uh, some improperly completed ballots in Alabama that were, were contested in that election, and then the whole Florida mess you know, with Bush and Gore. Um, so that's you know, something with the Electoral College. It focuses attention on those states uh, that are, are really close. And then you have the, the thing that the Supreme Court uh, largely resolves, though still could come into play, are the so-called faithless electors. And so the electors in the Electoral College are actual people. These are real human beings that go and vote in the Electoral College uh, for the president after the election is held. And so in 2016, there were five people who should have voted for Hillary Clinton. One ended up voting for Bernie Sanders, three voted for Colin Powell, and one uh, for a uh, uh, indigenous person, a leader, Faith Spotted Eagle, uh, two Trump electors end up voting for John Kasich and one for Ron Paul. And so that was the most uh, faithless electors we'd had uh, in, in many, many years. But the, the question then about this, is this legal? You know, can they actually do this? Um, there are 33 states that have laws that ban faithless electors, but of those, only about half would actually remove them or penalize them, find them in some way, or cancel the vote. Uh, of the, the people who voted some way other than the way the voters of the state said they were supposed to. And then in June, just a, a little over two months ago, Supreme Court had a unanimous ruling saying those laws are okay. So if states wanted to try to prevent these faithless electors, they, they could do that. Um, and Wisconsin, we have a law that says our electors are supposed to vote the way the voters say, but there's no penalty. There's no mechanism for keeping them from doing that if they want to. So the concern is in a really close election, you could have a couple electors that just change their mind and just vote for someone else and it could actually change the outcome of a, of a close race, which is really a problem. Now, if you really wanna be kept up at night worrying about these things, and I don't wanna give people nightmares, but, but the mother of all electoral college problems would be a tie vote. And, and this sounds like preposterous, like, right, okay, we're gonna have an exact tie in the electoral college. But check this out. This is not that hard to have this happen. Oh wait, first here are the just the, the map with the state laws of the, the variation with the faithless electors. 
Uh, so the green states like Wisconsin have, you're not supposed to do it, but there's no penalty. Um, the, uh, the states that uh, have the, the yellow are the ones that actually have a penalty. The blue states, I think, are the best approach where you actually cancel the, uh, the, the vote of a faithful selector. Um, and, so, and then the, the grayish states are the ones that don't have any laws at all uh, about the electors. Um, so this is the, now back to the tie vote. So here's the Electoral College map from 2016, uh, with Trump getting 306 electoral votes, Clinton uh, 232. Um, and you can see you know, the, uh, the states, the so-called blue wall that, that Trump uh, won of Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania to put them over the top. Now look what needs to happen to make this a tie vote. All you have to do is flip Michigan and Pennsylvania. So I'll toggle back and forth here so you can see. So there's, here's the 2016, here's the 2020 hypothetical map where all you do is switch Michigan, Pennsylvania, and the one vote in Maine. So Maine is one of those, whoops, let me go back. Uh, Maine is one of those states along with Nebraska where they uh, allow the electoral votes to be split by congressional district. And occasionally Nebraska or Maine will give one of the electoral votes to a different person than won the statewide vote, which happened actually in 2016. So Trump got one electoral vote in Maine and Clinton got the other three. Um, and so again, look at what happens in uh, potentially in 2020. So Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Maine all uh, flip that one vote in Maine and you end up with a 269 to 269 tie, an actual tie in electoral college. So at that point, you have to dig back into your high school civics class uh, and try to remember, okay, now what do we do? Like flip a coin, rocks, paper, scissors, arm wrestle, like how do we resolve this? Well, it gets thrown into the House of Representatives um, and each state, and this is the craziest part about the Electoral College, each state gets one vote in deciding who the president of the United States will be if there's a tie. That means that little North and South Dakota, Wyoming, that you know, have under a million people get the same number of electoral votes as California, Texas, Florida, New York, uh, the, the big states. is one vote per state. And you throw in the other odd part of this is that if you have a split delegation, so if you have an even number of House members and, you have a, and they're split between Democrats and Republicans, your state would not get any say in who the president of the United States will be because you'd have a split. Like, there's no way to resolve that split. And in fact, people have, have done some sort of predictions to try to figure out you know, if this would happen, like what would actually happen. And the best guess is that Trump would probably win because it looks like Republicans would probably control 26 states out of the, the 50, but that could go either way if Democrats would pick up more seats. But right now it looks like Trump would probably win uh, if there was this tie vote. Now, again, this is super unlikely to happen, but, but it's not impossible. You see, this map doesn't look that crazy. Again, it's exactly the same map we had in 2016 with just two states flipping, by the way, that Joe Biden leads in both those states right now. Uh, and so it's not too crazy that would happen. Now, what's more likely to happen is shown by this map. This was from the 270 to win. There are other poll aggregators that do similar things that try to forecast you know, where things stand right now. And according to projections as of yesterday or two days ago, I guess, um, the, it shows that you, know, uh, that you have um, Biden ahead and, and the, the top is being hidden for me. I can't see the 278, I think it was, uh, that he's ahead and for uh, Trump 169 with 91 electoral votes being toss up votes. And so, uh, Trump would have to carry every one of those toss-up states, so Arizona, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Ohio, and those two congressional districts in Maine and Nebraska, and that would still bring him up short, though. Uh, Biden would still win, even if Trump would you know, uh, sweep all of those toss-up states. Um, but that's pretty much the same map as I just showed you with the, the tie, except Wisconsin going for Biden. So Wisconsin really is one of the key battleground states, there's no doubt. Uh, that we're getting you know, all the national attention for a good reason, that we really uh, are going to be uh, one of the pivotal states here for sure. Um, okay, so what about possible reforms then in terms of uh, what could be done to change some of the, the problems we've seen? One would be to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And so this is uh, something that the House already had, had acted on and, and now uh, they are adding to it to, to honor uh, John Lewis. Uh, the first part would be to bring back Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act by restoring Section 4 um, that would 
cover the more of the state uh, with this practice-based preclearance that would target the preclearance uh, requirement in parts of the country that are most discriminatory in terms of voting practices. And that, I think, would be a, a really important change. Also, to put a, a hold on any changes in voting practices uh, 880 days before the election to make sure that you know, you're not moving around voting places, you're not you know, changing uh, voting districts you know, right before an election. Um, also then expanding the authority to send federal observers to polling places um, that are at risk for discrimination. That's one thing that we're you know, hearing some reports of uh, concern about in 2020 is voter intimida intimidation, where you know, they're you know, worried that people are gonna start showing up in polls, you know, trying to prevent people from voting. And that pretty clearly is something that should not be allowed. Uh, and then um, redistricting, uh, there are more efforts uh, to try to uh, get a bipartisan commission for redistricting. It's something we've talked about in Wisconsin for a long time, never been able to, to achieve it yet. Uh, but I think that it really would be an important change to, to make. Expanding early voting would definitely help. Uh, restoring voting rights for felons. There was a situation in Florida where in 2018, in the, mid, in the midterm elections, they passed a, a new uh, state law that re restored felon voting rights, but then the state legislature uh, undermined a lot of that, that by saying the felons had to like pay all of their fines they owed to the court before they could be restored their voting rights. And that affects a huge proportion of the people um, it's, uh, that have been denied their right to vote for, for that reason. And so it's not clear that uh, that's going to actually go into effect before the 2020 election. And then finally, for electoral college reform, there's this uh, very interesting idea that started about 10 years ago, I think, of the, the notion of the compact between the states. And this is a way to get around amending the Constitution, because the, 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 the surefire way to get rid of the electoral college is to amend the Constitution and say it'll be a straight popular vote. Well, that's never going to happen. There are too many states that don't see it in their interest to, to do that. And so this compact between the states is kind of a backdoor way um, to have the, the states that sign on the compact say they will allocate their votes to the popular vote winner, the national popular vote winner, not who won their state. And the, the compact then kicks in when a majority of the electoral votes have approved the plan, have signed up for the plan. Uh, and so right now, there are 15 states plus D.C. worth 196 electoral votes. It's getting close. Uh, and so the green states are the ones that have uh, passed already. The orange states has passed in one chamber. Uh, and, and yellow uh, indicated that Nevada, I think, has been added now you know, to the, the list. Uh, and so that is a, a way that we could have the popular vote actually uh, elect our president if you get enough states to sign up for that. Uh, now, there are people who say we should just leave the Electoral College alone. Um, they claim that there are advantages of the Electoral College system of more stability. It's the way we've always done it. It promotes the two-party system, which again contributes to that stability and potentially provides for more uh, decisive victories. Um, so I will leave it at that and open it up to your questions. I'll stop my share here. If you have a question for uh, Professor Cannon, you can go ahead and unmute yourself um, and he'll be, he'll be happy to take questions. And if you're more comfortable as doing your question in the chat space, we could do that too. Um, and I can, you know, do it that way, but uh, it's always, Good to hear from you as well and, and have you give your questions in person if you, if you like anyway. So I know there have to be questions. Covered a lot of ground there. Hi, this was incredibly comprehensive. Thank you so much for all the information. Uh, I just have a question about uh, this upcoming election. What is the best way for us to kind of ensure that not only is our vote counted, but that other people's votes are counted as well? Is there certain advocacy group that you would recommend us volunteering with or a certain method that you would suggest we vote by? Yeah, well, I, you know, I hate to say it, um, but voting in person is definitely the, the best way to make sure your vote will be counted. If you just look at the, the evidence of the you know, percent of rejected ballots and so on that I, that I went through, 
Um, there's, you know, so I voted by mail in both April and August, um, but I'm going to vote in person in November. I, I just, yeah, because I, I just want to make my sure, vote, make sure that my vote is counted. Um, it's not, you know, it, it doesn't happen that often. And if you're very careful about making sure that you do have your witness address there and make sure that you, uh, you know, sign it properly with the same signature you always use, I think there's a very, very low chance your ballot will be rejected. And so if you, for health reasons, if you really are concerned um, about voting in person and you really want to vote by mail, I don't want to discourage you from doing that because it, it definitely, you know, just make sure you're following the, the rules and having the, you know, follow the proper steps and crucially do it as soon as you can. And so you can go request your, your ballot, go to the, the clerk's uh, website, the medicine clerk, um, and, you know, or Middleton, I guess, you know, for, for you, many of you, uh, and request your ballot. And you can get on the list right now. They'll mail it out to you right when it's available. Send it back right away so you won't have to worry about the, the deadline. Um, and so that's, you know, almost as, as uh, sure a thing as voting in person. So only if you're being like super paranoid like me, you know, would you have to, you know, decide you're actually going to go uh, vote in person. So that, that's the, the first part of your question then. And in terms of what else can you do to help make sure that other people's votes are, are counted, um, I think that probably the locally one of the groups that is doing the, the most, I think, on voter registration and the questions about voting is the League of Women Voters. They have a, a long track record of, of really being concerned about uh, voting and trying to make sure people vote. I know that they you know, have a, a, a good voter outreach program. So they would be a good organization to volunteer for if you want to do that kind of, of work of both voter education and then registering people to vote. Other questions? It looks like we have a question from Jerry. Um, oh, you, you talked about League of Women Voters. Um, so just other unbiased information about candidates? Oh, yeah, well, that's, so the, the one thing that, yeah, people I think always are, you know, trying to, you know, who are trying to get more informed about the, the campaigns and about the candidates, um, you know, I think that one of the best places to go just to, to get information about what the candidates stand for is go to their own, the candidate websites and go, they're, they're trying to make their best case of what they stand for, what issues they care about. And so in today's online world, you know, where it's, it's relatively easy to get access to, you know, whatever information you want, I think that's probably the best source of, you know, what the candidates actually believe and what they actually say is see what they say themselves. That way you're not being mediated by any other pundit or blogger or media source. You're actually seeing their words of, of what their campaign wants to have out there. So in that case, you can consume the news pretty directly yourself. So if really what you're looking for are candidate positions, I would say the number one source should be the candidates' websites themselves. That's, that would be the, the starting place anyway. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the what is the process for a uh, signature matching? Yeah, so when you register to vote, you have to, to sign your registration form. And that's the, the form then that, that the, uh, the clerk will have on file with your voter registration. So when you then request an absentee ballot, they ma mail you the ballot. You have to sign your absentee ballot and it gets mailed back to the clerk's office, they will match that up with your voter registration form that you signed back when you registered. Uh, and they'll see, make sure they look, look the same. And you know, this is you know, subjective, obviously, but, it's, but you know, they have a lot of practice in, in looking at signatures. And, and they, you, know, you can tell when you look at a signature if it's uh, you know, uh, completely different than what the person's signature really was. Um, and that's why it's relatively easy to catch like voter fraud because the person who's trying to commit voter fraud has no idea what your signature looks like. They don't have that in front of them. Like if you're, you know, if you're a good forger and you have someone's signature you're trying to forge, you know, you could probably do that. But, but the person who would be engaging in, 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 the, in voting fraud wouldn't know what your signature looks like. So what are the chances it could come even close to looking like yours? And so that's why they use that signature match because it's a 
the, probably the best way of making sure the person who cast that ballot is actually who they claim that they are. Okay, we'll do just one more minute. If you have any other questions, um, please again, feel free to either unmute or use the chat box. We, since we've got our expert here. All right, well, I will remind everybody that um, we do have a, a ballot box um, in the library parking lot. Uh, so if you do, um, have a have a ballot and um, can't vote in person. You can drop your ballot off um, in the in the drop right outside the library. And I I hope everybody gets out there to vote in November. Um, David, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Um, and have a good evening. Thank you everyone for joining. Good with you. All right. See everybody. Bye.